And thank you all for, for um, coming out this morning to join our discussion about solutions journalism and how it can strengthen accountability and engagement. My name is Tina Rosenberg, and I am, um, I write a, I'm co-writer of a column in the New York Times called Fixes, which is a solutions journalism column. And with my co-writer, we founded an organization called the Solutions Journalism Network, which is dedicated to legitimizing and promoting this idea. And joining me on the panel today, we have representatives from four different countries. Um, Jim Schachter will go second, and he is the Vice President for News at WNYC, which is the largest uh, local public radio station in the United States. Then after that, we will have Lindsay Sample, who is the managing editor of Discourse Media, which is, uh, and she is a former investigative reporter for CBC. Discourse is a Vancouver-based news organization that is focused on in-depth storytelling, and it is driven by community engagement, and she will have very interesting things to say about what that means in a few minutes. Then we will have Ulrich Hagerup, who um, recently left his job as news director of DR, which he wants me to describe as a mini BBC, um, but based in Copenhagen. Um, and now, after 10 years of doing that, he has just quit to put all his efforts into a, a new institute called the Constructive Institute, which he will talk about. And then last, we will have George Brock, who is a former uh, journalist for the Times of London, who now is a part-time professor of journalism at City University London. So um, my job is to first let you know what it is we mean by the term solutions journalism when we use that term. And I understand that we don't, we don't have a monopoly on the term, but I'm going to tell you how we define it. Um, so the mission of the Solutions Journalism Network, which is based in the United States, although we are now spreading our tentacles towards world domination um, coming into to Europe and Africa and parts of South America, uh, our mission is to legitimize and, and spread the practice of solutions journalism, which we define as rigorous reporting about how people are responding to social problems and what, a, what the results are that they are getting. Um, we work with newsrooms. We're not a destination site, but we try and help newsrooms integrate this practice um, into their own work. And this is a map of uh, probably about a quarter of our newsrooms right now. We have about uh, 80 or 90 newsroom partners in the United States right now, and we are, um, as I said, um, working overseas. Um, we also have, and this is a very interesting tool that you might find, um, a story tracker, which has a searchable database of solution stories, some of which we had something to do with, some of which we did not. And we have a couple of thousand stories in it. We are uh, slowly tagging them to make them visible, but we have I think this is uh, uh, 1,872 stories right now. So if you're ever working on uh, um, a, a series or article and want to know what's been published elsewhere about what works, you might want to take a look at the story tracker. Right now it's heavily US-centered, but we are going to be changing that, and we are going to be also adding stories in, in French and in Spanish. Um, so what is solutions journalism? This is an example. Our first big project was with the Seattle Times, which was, is a uh, very well-known and, and widely respected um, newspaper in, in Seattle, Washington. And they got tired of doing story after story about how lousy Seattle's public education system is. And they um, decided to start a project where every month they would do a package of stories about something that works in public education usually in the city of Seattle or in the state of Washington, but they've also gone all over the United States to look at what works. This was their first story. And the, um, I don't know if you can read the caption, but the last line in the caption is very interesting. Um, well, I'll read the whole caption. For years, students at White Center Heights Elementary School logged some of the lowest test scores in King County. Then teachers tried something new and the numbers soared by double digits in just one year. So what happened and could it be replicated elsewhere? And that is sort of the key question in solutions journalism. What happened here? How did they do it? What about it can we learn that's useful for our own reporting? Um, so when we talk about solutions journalism, it's, I find it useful to define it by what it isn't. People think it's certain things. Um, for example, they think it's hero stories. Um, it's not. A hero story is about celebrates a person for their good qualities, very often their generosity or selfishness or good intentions. It's not solutions journalism, because real solutions journalism concentrates on what's the effectiveness of what they're doing. 
they look at evidence of results. And hero stories are often not interested in evidence of results. Another imposter is the silver bullet story. This, unfortunately, ran in the New York Times. Um, and the first line of the story is, sometimes a soccer ball is more than just a ball. Sometimes it's a lifesaver. And this is about a soccer ball that never deflates. So I would call this an example of overclaiming. <laughs> Um, these reporters went, uh, this reporter went well beyond what the data allows you to say about the effects of this product and is claiming way too much. That's bad journalism. Another um, imposter is the favor for a friend story. This is a story about Tom's shoes that looks like it might have been written by Tom's shoes. Um, first line is the idea was genius, really. I mean, it's essentially a one source press release, um, not solutions journalism. Um, think tank stories. This is a rather subtle distinction, but a think tank story is where the journalist says, here's how I think we should solve this problem. Real solutions journalism says, let's look at how someone is actually trying to solve the problem, and we're going to report on that and tell you what's working and not working about it. So the distinction is between a theoretical proposal and something that's on the ground and we can cover and report on. Not celebrate, but report on. Another uh, imposter is the afterthought. Uh, we do this all the time, journalists do. This is a um, documentary about the uh, prison industrial complex. It spends 85 of its 90 minutes talking about the evils of the prison industrial complex. And then apparently the filmmaker said, man, this is really a downer. We can't leave people so darn depressed. So let's mention in the last five minutes that there are things going on to try and solve this problem. But nothing in depth, not looking at whether they're working or not. It's just purely to try and undercut this, the doom and gloom that, that very often happens when you, um, when you dedicate a, a long piece or a long series to a very depressing subject. So real solutions journalism goes also may include, and has to include actually, reporting on the problem, but goes in depth as to what, it, what this particular response to the problem, what results they're getting. Instant activist stories, also an imposter, they tell the audience how you can become part of the solution. Here's what you can do to help. Now, some news, news organizations are comfortable with that, some are not. Um, it's often something you can put on top of solutions journalism but it is not solutions journalism. Solutions journalism is simply reporting the news. And the news just happens to be, let's look at how someone is trying to solve a problem. And then finally, my, my favorite, the, the house mascot of SJN, Crispy Bacon, the disabled pig whose, whose uh, owner made him a wheelchair. I don't know why people think this is solutions journalism. I guess it's a solution for Chris. But um, this, is, this is inspiring. A lot of videos you see um, are inspiring, but real solutions journalism isn't just inspirational, it's also insightful. It offers information that's important that people can use when they're trying to solve a problem. And I guess for the disabled pigs of the world, this video is insightful, but, but, but not, for the, not for the rest of us. Um, so real solutions journalism has these four qualities. It is always gonna have people in it, but the real hero of the story is the work. What is the response to the problem, um, and how did it happen? Second of all, it looks at evidence of results uh, and effectiveness, not just good intentions. Third of all, it's insightful and not just inspirational. And fourth, it talks about what's not working about the response, because as we know, there is no such thing as a perfect solution. So it avoids reading like a puff piece by discussing the limitations of what we're reporting on. It doesn't celebrate, it reports. Um, so how can solutions journalism be used to further accountability? I'd like to tell briefly the story of how I got into solutions journalism, because I think this illustrates um, this point very well. About, well, it was 17 years ago now. In the, in the year 2000, I was working for the Sunday Magazine of the New York Times, and I pitched my editor on a story, an investigative piece I wanted to do about the price of AIDS medicines in poor countries. And the fact that in countries where the AIDS burden was the highest, the um, price of AIDS drugs was also the highest, which basically ensured that nobody could get them. That was widely known at the time. What was not widely known was why this was going on. And the reason was collusion between the pharmaceutical industry and the Clinton administration, which was at the behest of Big Pharma, putting pressure on poor countries not to make or buy generic drugs. So I thought this was a pretty important investigative story. And I pitched it to my editor. 
And my editor said, can't do it. It's too damn depressing. Can't run another 7,000 word story on how everybody's gonna die in Malawi, which all our readers know. So um, I was disappointed, but I rethought the story, and then I came up with a reframing. There was one country that was not succumbing to this pressure. It was actually telling Big Pharma and the Clinton administration to go to hell. It was making its own generics and providing them for free to all its people, and that was Brazil. So then the story became, how was Brazil able to do this? And what was the pressure they were fending off? And in the course of telling that story, I managed to say everything I wanted to say about the bad behavior that was going on. It just turned it inside out. So this became a much more successful way of doing the story. Um, among other reasons, because it got into the paper, which is sort of job one. Um, I didn't write the headline, by the way. I think that's probably overclaiming. But it was, it was much fresher. It was, we got a huge response from readers. It wasn't depressing. It felt empowering to people to know that, in fact, there is a way out of this problem, and Brazil was doing it. And in fact, now this is what's going on all over the world. So this convinced me that here was a really great method of doing, um, doing a depressing story. And since basically all I did was depressing stories, <laughs> Um, I now use this all the time, but I felt that this also increased the accountability factor much more because it showed that you can do this. It took away the excuses of people who were not doing it, and that is the accountability factor in solutions journalism. Um, one of our partners who uses this a lot is the Cleveland Plain Dealer, and they did a series um, on lead paint in Cleveland. They had done a few, but this one was different because it looked at what other cities were doing that was successful. So they really came out and said this, here's what other cities do that Cleveland isn't doing. And that put a lot of pressure on Cleveland officials to clean up their act. So when you use this, when you use this approach, it takes a problem from inevitable, inevitable, we can't do anything about lead, it's just a problem that's out there, nobody can solve it, to unacceptable, because Rochester's solving it. Other cities are solving it. So they actually ran this chart in the paper. Here's what, other, here's what successful cities do, and here's what Cleveland does. And that had a lot of impact. Um, engagement is the other question we're looking at here, and um, we're gonna be talking about that more, but one of, the, um, one of the sort of most important studies of news came in 2008 when the Associated Press studied young adults and how they consume news, and this, this drawing was actually in the original report. And the, the results actually bear out this poor guy who has his head in his hands. But they found that news fatigue brought many of the participants to a learned helplessness response, that the relentless negativity of news led to the desire to turn out, to tune out. In essence, we're selling a product that is painful to consume for most of our, of our audience. Um, but when people thought something that could be done about a problem, even if it was small, they tuned back in. And there is a lot of evidence about this. Um, BBC, when we have Mary Hockaday here, who is the, um, what's your title, Mary, again? World Service English Controller. Right, Controller of World, BBC World Service English, and they did a study of their digital audience, young people. 64% of their under 35s wanted more solutions journalism, and that was their top content request. Um, the New York Times did a survey of its mobile users. Anybody know what their top content request was? It was more weather, actually. But, so, but solutions journalism was second place. Um, so this is something that young people do engage with and want. Um, we, um, with the University of Texas's uh, Engaging News Project, we did a survey with them. We helped them by supplying two versions of the same article, and they found these differences in how people engage with solutions journalism. And I think the second one is interesting. I would read more articles from the same newspaper. So there's a spillover effect if you're once you read the solution story, it does get you back in, which I know is not, it's one definition of engagement. It's not the one that a lot of people here are gonna talk about. So um, once again, this, this is how to find us. We're the Solutions Journalism um, Network, and now I'm going to turn it over to Jim, if you wanna come over here and show your slides. One journal, good morning. Um, 
Thank you, Tina, for inviting me to be here, and thank you to the Solution, Solutions Journalism Network for providing some support to WNYC for some of the, the work that we've done in this area. If anybody else has any money, we're a public radio station, and I'll be at the back of the room uh, uh, at, with a hat, mugs, uh, whatever. Um, uh, WNYC is a, uh, a, a local news organization in the main part. We get our national and international coverage from, from NPR and focus our, our enterprise reporting efforts on the, the New York, New Jersey area that we serve. But one of the challenges, I think, uh, in this kind of work is, is to, go, uh, to go where the, the solutions uh, quest leads you. And, and the story I want to talk mostly about today is one that took us far outside of our, of our uh, uh, normal places that we, we report on. Uh, the, the story that we worked on was about uh, juvenile justice in our area. Uh, one of our reporters, Sarah Gonzalez, uh, uh, had a sense from working with her editors and from reading she'd done and reporting she'd begun to do that there was a disproportionate uh, sentencing of uh, young men mainly, but young people of color to uh, uh, long terms in adult prison in New York and New Jersey. So uh, she tackled this the way that you would typically tackle a story. She went digging through the data, she talked to experts, she tried to get a, 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 a scope around the nature of the, of the problem. But because this was a project that we were tackling uh, with a conscious effort to engage in solutions-minded uh, uh, reporting, she was also looking for uh, what are we going to do about it? How can you even think about, begin to think about this differently? But for the audience, we said the thing that we need to do first is define the problem. So you can see from the headline the, uh, the nature of, of what we, we saw. We, we did a lot of looking at uh, data that nobody had been able to gather before and tried to, um, to visualize it. And uh, for those whose eyesight is anything like mine, I'll, I'll summarize. Uh, what we basically found is that in, in um, uh, virtually every county in uh, New Jersey in particular that had a, a population of any size of people of color, um, uh, it, it was almost exclusively uh, uh, black and Hispanic uh, uh, teenagers who were getting adult sentences, even where, uh, as is the case in most places in the state, the vast majority of the population is, uh, is white. Um, the, the, the chart on the right says uh, almost 90% of minors prosecuted as adults in New Jersey are black or Hispanic. And the, uh, the, uh, the population of black and Hispanic people in, in the state is, uh, I think, together something under 20%. So you could see the disproportion, perhaps uh, what you'd expect, but the, the notion that this is one of the few places in the country where uh, even up to the point that this reporting was done uh, last year, uh, you could, as a teenager, be sentenced to 30, 40, 50, 60 years in prison as a 14 or 15 or 16 year old for, not for murder, but for armed robbery, uh, I think was startling to people who, who, for whom they didn't know anybody that had happened to. So we established the problem, and, and, and this is, I think, the twist. This is, as Tina was saying, this is the thing that turns your thinking about a story inside out. Uh, this is just the way things are where we live. If you're a legislator, if you are a person working in the corrections system, if you're a per person working in the justice system, the frame of how things work in New York and New Jersey is what I just showed you. Um, uh, Sarah Gonzalez had, had a, an obligation in this assignment to go searching for uh, another way of thinking about it. And as she did her reporting, she determined that there was nowhere in the United States that could really represent an entirely different approach. Certainly nowhere, uh, our travel budget generally involves buses and, and subways. Uh, uh, certainly nowhere that we would normally go to to report on a story. And her reporting discovered that um, uh, 
a place that had a very different approach was Germany. So with, with uh, Tina's organization support, she got on a plane and went to Germany. And I wanted to play you just a little bit of sound of what it was that she uh, found, if I could figure out how to do this. Uh, let's go back. Push the space bar. All right, this is, this is Sarah Gonzalez. Nope. The mouse, ah, very good, thank you, team. There are horses and baby goats and sheep inside Nostralitz prison. There's a vineyard inside the prison where juvenile inmates make their own wine to give as gifts to their visitors. I got a bottle. And there are coffee pots all over the prison. Inmates hang out by the coffee with their glass mugs and little metal teaspoons like it's a water cooler. And the prison guards in Germany, they don't get shank-proof vests or batons or pepper spray. There are also female inmates in here. And Marie-Christine Lim, who runs the prison, says they're all dating the male inmates. If they want to hold hands, they can hold hands. If they want to hug, they can hug. Basically, they don't have sex, I hope. <laughs> you hope? There, there should be no time to do that. <laughs> okay, but um, they, they kiss? They kiss, yeah. German prisons are supposed to mirror the outside world. They say that helps prisoners learn how to live a life without crime when they get out. One of the inmates, though, Miland, he doesn't have a girlfriend in here. No, no, <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> When I interview Milan, we're in his room. Sorry, what is this? What? This door. That's the toilet. Oh, you have a door to your toilet? Of course. <laughs> of course. I, I think of course. So, um, what I should have brought a clip of is how the story began, which was uh, the story of a uh, of a mom who's son at age 14 was sentenced to um, uh, 40 years in prison for an, for an armed robbery and who, who goes uh, once a week to see her son and has been doing it now for, as I recall, something like 20 years while his life wastes away in prison. So if you remember Tina's chart from her presentation, uh, uh, you, could, you could hear the the, uh, the giddiness in, uh, in Sarah's voice at discovering uh, this alternative. Uh, I would say that, that this, this project did not exactly uh, go on to examine the, the limitations and the, the obvious political obstacles in the United States and New Jersey where Sarah was reporting from for, for uh, making this kind of change happen. Uh, so I think that we probably fell a bit short of what all we could have done, but we um, decided to stick with the subject. And we have a team of seven or eight journalists who are working on a, on a big project about juvenile justice that builds on some of what we learned here that um, will, among other things, visit a just-opened uh, juvenile correction facility in Connecticut, one state away, we can afford this ticket on our own, um, to uh, where the governor made the same trip to the same place that we visited and saw that there is an entirely different approach to doing this work and has now in the process, I think they've just opened the first jail in Connecticut that, and the first jail in the United States that takes this sort of German style approach. We're gonna tra uh, track the the history of how American juvenile justice got to be so uh, draconian, which as is often the case, begins with a, a story of a, of a terrible, terrible incident, uh, a, a murder by a young man in, in New York in the 1970s, and a politician, the governor of New York at that time, who was running for reelection and decided he needed to uh, crack down in order to get reelected, and that set the country on a 35-year path toward the kind of picture that, that, that we found. Um, the, uh, I'll mention a couple of other things briefly. The, uh, this, this work, I think, helped inspire us to, to go on to think about other things in a similar vein. 
Um, we have a project that we, we call the affordability project, trying to figure out how, how people can make it in New York City, which is one of the most expensive places in the world to live, and where many, many, many people uh, do not have, uh, in our, our people are spending 60, 70 percent of their income on housing and other things that are just entirely out of whack. We're taking the approach there of, in part, uh, having, having a reporter, producer, uh, hang out in a neighborhood for three or four months at a time to, uh, to just listen. I think if you go to various events at this conference, you're going to hear from various organizations about ways that they've set, them, set themselves up uh, to have listening posts in various communities. Our station, at its heart, is a talk radio station. We, uh, it, is, it is natural for us to put a question out and find out what's going on, but we don't always, if you just take the calls from your callers, you get the people who are already listening. So we're sitting ourselves down in neighborhoods from the Bronx to Staten Island to Queens uh, to Brooklyn to, to just be there and let people tell us what their issues are. And then phase next is the search, perhaps outside the boundaries of what they're familiar with, for what's going on around the city, around the region, around the country to tackle some of, of those uh, issues. Uh, and, and I think that we've gotten ourselves reoriented by, by having our, our eyes opened up. Last thing I'll say is that in saying all that, it really shouldn't be such a huge discovery. One of my first jobs was at the, uh, the Kansas City Star newspaper a long time ago. And uh, I remember being sent out, uh, that there were about 25 of us assigned to a project in 1985 to figure out how Kansas City could reestablish its local uh, regional economy and get things going again. And we were sent to 25 different cities to find like one great idea. Now I missed, I was away for the day that the assignments weren't given out. So I went to Omaha, Nebraska, <laughs> but uh, discovered that they had, I, I think Warren Buffett paid for it, um, that they had, had entirely rebuilt the geography of their downtown and that was the solution that, that I brought back. So this is a pretty time-honored concept. It may be have, have a new name, but I don't think we should be scared that this is something that's so strange or foreign or uh, unseemly for journalists to do. Uh, it really does make the kind of connections that, that, uh, uh, that we are needing to make with our communities. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So as Tina said earlier, uh, my name is Lindsay Sample. I'm the managing editor at a place you might have never heard of called Discourse Media. Uh, we are a journalism company based in Vancouver. Um, and we're a startup. So the first thing that I'm going to say, there's contact info if you need it, <laughs> is what is Discourse Media today? And I put the word today on there because we're talking about accountability and since we're a startup, we're constantly changing and growing and I don't want you guys to hold me accountable for saying what it is and then you, you check in a couple months later and we've, we've changed and shifted. Um, so, so we are an in-depth journalism company. We, we kind of toy with the word investigative versus in-depth and, and we've landed on in-depth because while we do produce investigative journalism, um, we're, we're looking at the systemic issues and not all of our stories are, you know, an investigation. A, we're, we're piecing it off in different ways. Um, and we, we look at systemic issues to try to cut through the noise and, and help our, the public understand what's going on and, and why, you know, kind of what people have, have already spoken about, you know, this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem. And I used to work as an investigative producer and Investigating problems is really interesting, but if we don't pause and think, what are the systemic issues that l keep leading to the same problems, um, then, then we're in the same place 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Um, and so part of what, what we do is we came, we came together as a team not that long ago and, and reassessed, as, as startups do, um, who we are and what we're doing, and we landed on three core values for Discourse Media. 
Uh, the first one is that more traditional um, investigative journalist approach, which is expose buried truths. Uh, the second one is break down complexity. And the third one is inspire action. So why focus on solutions? Um, in order to understand what that means for us, you kind of need to understand our process. So a big part of our process is community-driven engagement. And what we mean by that is all of our reporters have to go out into the community based on the beats that they're reporting on and ask people, um, what do you want to know? What, don't you want, what do you think journalism is, isn't getting right? Um, and then also, what's something that you think a journalist should investigate? And so the reason why solutions becomes so central to that is so many people that we hear from are saying, we want to know how to fix this. How do we make it better? How do we not keep reporting on you know, a kid that died in the child welfare system? Because there's going to be another kid next year, and there's going to be another kid. And it just feels depressing, um, which, which kind of hits on what, what people here have been saying. Um, and so that engagement process really means that solutions journalism has to be a tool that our reporters have in their toolbox. Um, and then the other, the other part of that as well is an impact strategy. So when our reporters are working on beats, we, after doing this question-driven engagement, we bring everyone back together and say, okay, what are we gonna do and what impact do we want it to have? We have big lofty goals in terms of impact that aren't just things that discourse is going to do, um, but what change would we want to see 10 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now? Um, and then what can we actually do? And in that impact strategy design, we're, we're deciding what stories we're going to report on and um, how we're going to reflect what we're hearing from community. Um, so the, the specific project that I want to talk to you about is a project that we call Power Struggle, which is about investigating global energy poverty and looking at solutions in a time of climate change. And so the way that this project started out was um, there, we had a fellowship last year for nine fellows reporting on energy access solutions around the world. Um, and the goal was to create a hub. So it's one thing, there's lots of fellowships that are happening as more and more as news organizations are being cut back and international reporting is, um, is not funded the way it used to be, right? So we wanted to do a fellowship that looked specifically at solutions to this problem to create a hub that people could come together on and, and understand the data journalism and understand the the different things that are happening from northern Canada to Kribati to you know Zimbabwe um, and, and bring it all together and so that's what we did and we're doing another round this year that it has four fellows specifically focused on sub-Saharan Africa so we have a fellow from Togo, a fellow from Zimbabwe, a fellow from Nigeria and a fellow from the DRC and the, it's being led by uh, Richard Poplack, who's a reporter based in South Africa, who's got Canadian connections to the issue as well. Um, and so with this project specifically, I wanted to answer the question directly, um, how does this strengthen engagement? So there's two different ways to think about it. One is we work with, with organizations or, or reporters who want their content shared. You know, a reporter in Togo doesn't necessarily have access to the New York Times or to other, other international media outlets. And by specifically focusing on solutions journalism, the stories are better that they're pitching to organizations. It's stories that people have never, never heard of. Um, and so that's part of it. The, the strategic part of it is that, you know, it leads to better engagement in, in that it's going to get more eyeballs. Uh, from our reporting last year, we had reports in Al Jazeera, reports that were picked up by the New York Times, reports that were picked up by The Guardian, and a whole bunch of outlets all around the world. Um, and the second thing that, that really matters here is um, it makes the public care and it builds trust. So you're gonna get more engagement if you're actually answering the questions that people have about an issue. Um, and you're gonna get more engagement if it's a twist that, that people have never heard about. And especially in, in some of the areas that we've been working on where um, the, the reporting cycles just are, are often exposing problems and scandals and things like that. To have a deep investigation that looks at solutions is really rare. Um, and so with accountability, how does this strengthen accountability? Um, 
here, it's, it's kind of two ways. One, for us, solutions journalism uh, holds us accountable to our audience. So we've heard a lot from people who say, oh, great. Sure, you're going to do that. Let's see it. And so it holds us accountable to, to that community engagement process and, and to, to audiences around the world. And then it also, as, as Tina mentioned earlier, it does hold governments accountable. If you're looking at, if you're truly investigating solutions, um, you're exposing what could be better. And it gives clear steps that people can take um, to get there. And so I know that we're tight for time, so I don't want to spend too long but um, what's next for, for us and for this project? Um, specifically, we have Richard who is working on Canada's connection to energy access in Sub-Saharan Africa. So part of us doing this project was we didn't want to just have fellows reporting in countries, which is really interesting. They're doing great work that's ongoing right now. But we wanted to look at what is our role in all of this and, and what what accountability does the Canadian government and Canadian funders have for their role in Sub-Saharan Africa and, and what kind of solutions are available there as well. So it's an ongoing thing. I don't have you know, the metrics right now to tell you what's going to happen, um, but the solutions journalism practice is a key part of that, um, especially in this reporting that we're doing right now. So leave it there. Hi, I'm Ulrich Hagrup. I'm a journalist. I, want, I, I wanted to become a journalist since I was, I think, 12, 13. And I think I went into this profession pretty much for the same reason as all of you did. We wanted to do good for society, tell important stories, uh, in order for people to make up their own mind, right? Um, but then I went into journalism school, and I remember the first day, um, Oh, 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 hang on, I'll put it here. I don't know what that says, but that's okay. It's probably okay. It's Italian, but uh, okay, it works. <laughs> okay, um, I went to journalism school, and the first day my teacher told us, a good story is a bad story. <laughs> if nobody gets mad, it's advertising. And I became part of this culture of news. Uh, also, when I get my first job as in, 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 in newsrooms, and uh, people kept telling me that we should focus on conflicts, angle stories on drama, on crooks, and on victims. And we did that. And at some point, I looked myself into the mirror and asked myself, was I really doing good for society, or was I doing good for my career? Or was I doing good for my peers? So I did stories that my, my fellow journalists in the newsroom, they liked, that could win me prizes, that my editors liked, which was very good to put a headline on. And with that kind of journalism, which was not, I was not, I was not telling lies, but was I, my aim to do good was my aim to make people understand the world better or just to do what I thought was journalism because that was culture. So when I realized that was not the case, I, that, that I, I, then I needed to, to change something. That, that's the, the project I've been on for 10 years. I've been uh, executive director of news at DR, which is the equivalent of the BBC. We are 10% of the BBC with 100% of its problems. Um, and that's why... And, and the answer to these questions of what is journalism and what should I do as a reporter, as an editor, a part of this fantastic and troubled profession, profession uh, the answer to that was I need to quit my job. I need to involve myself in uh, trying to change uh, news culture in Denmark and abroad, if I can do that, joining all the good people, uh, uh, having the same frustrations I, that I have. And... Uh, 1st of September, we will launch what we call Constructive Institute, 
Uh, it will be uh, uh, an institute based on Aarhus University, which is the second biggest university in, in uh, Denmark, a very good university. And we'll do basically three things. We'll do projects, science projects, uh, finding out what, what is the impact of journalism to the public debate and democracy. If we do something different, would that work? Uh, try to come up with new formats for a new way of discussing big problems in society. Um, educational material. Uh, we'll try to spread the word doing keynotes, master classes around the world and in Denmark, and we'll have a joint uh, fellowship program uh, where we bring six Danish and six international fellows for uh, one academic year to all in order to understand the big challenges on the beat they're covering um, and, and also looking for possible solutions uh, to them. And meanwhile, we give them an ed ed education in constructive storytelling. That's the idea. Um, and we already have funding for six, and we hope next year we'll have 12, all in all. The problem is, and Thomas Patterson, who's a professor of Harvard, has put it like this, for our industries, the real bias of the press is not that it's liberal. Its bias is a decided preference for the negative. And I think he's right. Um, and the reason why I decided I really have to do something about this was during the American presidential election. And I was wondering, how can these people vote for this guy? I'm not talking about politics, but, <laughs> but it's interesting to see and also scary. And the reason why Donald Trump got media exposure for 1.9 billion US dollars, which he, sh he should have, could have paid in advertising, but he got it for free because media overexposed him because it was a good story, because he created drama, conflict, and he talked about crooks, Mexicans and Muslims, and victims, all of you, you are losers, but I'll make you winners. That was the reason why. And when this business school logic that has influenced our industry came to one very interesting expression when CBS News was being accused of why are you broadcasting live from all of Donald Trump's rallies very early in the presidential election, at a time when he was not big, but he was, he was saying so crazy things that it was so entertaining. And some people loved it, and a lot of people hated it, but they broadcasted it live, all of it. And his answer to this, the CEO of CBS, really shows the disease in our industry. He said, it might not be good for America, but it's damn good for CBS. The money's rolling in. Bring it on, Donald. Go on ahead. Keep on going. And so he did, right? This is forgetting what journalism is about. Journalism is not a product. Yes, it's a product to be sold. We need people to pay for it some way. But the reason we, we went into this business, the reason why we are publishers, is not to make money. It's a mean, it's not a goal. We, journalism is the fundament for any democracy, and we face tremendous crisis in our democratic debate, and we are also to blame for it, not only politicians. Because politicians try to follow what we do. So if we angle stories on t in a tabloid way, politicians will too. And then politics become tabloid, right? So if we start to do something different, if we start to ask different questions, we get different answers. And we change the conversation. So we have a responsibility. I had a, the fortune to be invited to talk to the BBC, the mother of all journalism. Normally you go to the BBC to, to listen, but I was invited to talk to the BBC and was very proud. So I just took a screenshot that morning about what is the picture of the world because this is, this is how you, you phrase the world. And they do this every day and so do the rest of news media all around the world because this is what you do. This is how you angle the story. This is the best obtainable version of the truth that day at the BBC. And just look at the word. It's about things that blow up, people who are dying, people who are crazy, and it's terrible, terrible, terrible thing. And it, none of the stories are wrong, but is this an actual picture of the world? Or is it just the product of our news culture, what we think are news? This is a global illness, and we see it all around the world, and the, this is one of the reasons why people are turning their backs on traditional news, especially women, especially young people. They are fed up with it, and it's creating apathy and disengagement. 
And the reason why we became reporters and editors was we wanted to create engagement and we want to enlighten people. But we paint with, the, with black ink all the time. Why do we do that? People do research on this. They say news media are now so full of stories and misery and negativity controls news flow and therefore also politics and the public debate. Apathy or fear is the result. The risk is that people not only deselect media as sources for news, but also that they disengage in the public debate. And if we went into this profession, was it to create that result? Or if it was not, shouldn't we change? Yes, we should. I think it's David Bornstein funding with Tina, the Solution Journalism Network, who has put it like this, journalism is a feedback mechanism to help society, society self-correct. And I think it's a very, very good sentence. And I think that's the key. And what I'm talking about, what, what we're talking about here, is this some kind of North Korean version of journalism where we ignore problems? No, it's not. <laughs> it's a supplement to normal criteria. It's not an alternative, it's a supplement to normal criteria for news. It's the idea that people also need inspiration to solution and stories that focus on ways out and hope. And it's about possibilities and people who do something the rest of us might learn from. I have made this table. It's very boring but it's efficient. I'll go through it very fast. There are three ways, three types of journalism. And we, we have been taught at journalism schools about two of them. My idea is we need to add a third one. The two, and more and more newsrooms, they're focused on the first, which is breaking news. We think our goal is to be Twitter, and we can't. And that's not, that's not the idea. But we focus so much on breaking news, it's about now. The goal is speed. The questions we are to ask are what and when. The style is the more dramatic, the better. We play the role as ambulances or police, and we focus and we angle our stories on drama and conflict. The more conflict and the more dramatic, the better, right? Then we have investigative journalism, which is a very, very important thing. Very costly, and too few people spend their time on it. But what is investigative journalism? It's always about yesterday. The goal is to put blame. We ask the question of, okay, who did it? Who's responsible? And why did it happen? Our style is critical. We play a role as prosecutor and sometimes as a judge. And we angle our stories on crooks and on victims. And here's what we're talking about in this panel. We add something to this. You can't be constructive. You can't talk about solutions if you haven't documented there's a problem. Constructive journalism, what is that? Constructive journalism is about tomorrow. It's always about tomorrow. The goal is to be inspirational. We ask new questions like, okay, now we know that. Now what and how? The style is curious. We play the role as a facilitator and we focus and angle our stories on best practice and possible solutions, right? Got it? Okay, one example. For instance, in Denmark, we have a huge problem. I guess you have the same one in your countries. Young doctors don't want to move out of the university cities. They stick there because they like the cafe latte cafes and the lifestyle there. They don't want to move to the rural districts. A big problem, even in a small country like Denmark. So we can do breaking news. People actually die because there are no doctors. So we do that. And we do investigative stories. How does this happen? Why did this happen? And we invite the Minister of Health into the studio, and he will say, it's not my fault, it's the region's. Okay, we call talk to the people of the region. Say, it's not our fault, it's the union. We're talking, we're talking. So if we are very good, the goal of our journalism can be, they will put in commission, they will do a report, they will, it will come out in five years, and nobody will read it, and, but we'll win a prize for it. We documented there's a problem. But what do people need in the rural districts? As you say, they want, how can it be fixed? So what is the constructive angle? When we have done the breaking news, when we have done the investigative angle, that's the constructive angle. And we sit and we watch a European map, and we say, has anyone experienced something like this? And what do they do about it? And we, we look, have you seen Norway? Norway, it's crazy. They educate their doctors in Oslo. It's 1,747 kilometers to Tromsø up there. How do they get doctors to move up there? And we called them, and they told us, this, is, this has been a big problem. 
nobody dared to move to northern Norway because there were no doctors, because they didn't want to live there. So it was, it was life-threatening. So what happened was we needed to do something. So we asked, what did you do? They said, come up and see. So we went up there and did a story, a constructive story about something which is uh, inspirational to our debate in Denmark. They had the problem, they did something, can we learn from that? And I will just play a very short clip. It's in the world language Danish. <laughs> I have translated it for you, so. Sneen ligger stadig spredt ud på fjellet her på kanten af sommeren, og rensdyrene de æder lav i vejkanten. Kom ind, kom ind. Vi er på det lille sygehus i byen Hammerfest ved Barenshavet, verdens nordligste by, som de kalder den. Sier i Strand Pedersen har skiftet storbyen ud med det øde Nordnorge. Men ellers så ser jeg her kjempefint ud. Hun er også lukket hertil af de økonomiske fordele, der gælder alle tilflyttere til Finnmarken. Lavere skat, bedre huslån, billigere strøm og rabat på studiegælden. Finnmarken er større end hele Danmark, men der bor kun 80.000 mennesker, og der er blot to sygehuse. Din første baby. Ja. Et ensomt sted, der kræver sin kvinde. Finder man nogle ting, så, så er man veldig mye. Bla bla bla, you get the idea. Okay, but just to say, I mean, it never say this is the solution. That's not solution-focused journalism. That's not constructive. That's activism or politics. But we can inspire, just as well as we can facilitate debates about a possible problem and document, we can facilitate debates about possible solutions without crippling any values of traditional journalism. And that's important to understand. But there are traps of, about this, and around the world people are talking about it, and they are messing things up, and it's dangerous. First of all, be a journalist. Don't be an activist. Be a publisher not a politician. Don't stop being critical. Don't be blind to the problems of the world. Give an accurate picture. The idea is that you should give a positive picture. Yeah, give an accurate picture. And don't mistake constructive news with a cute story before the weather. So, did you know that Obama stole his slogan from Bob the Builder? He did, but that's it. We have a problem. Can we fix it? Yes, we can. Thank you. I don't need to move. I'm just relying on the, on the spoken word. And I'm going to rely on the spoken word, if you'll forgive me, pronounced at warp speed, because we're going to run out of time very quickly. Uh, I'm going to issue one or two very small cautions about this, following the tone of Ulrich's last slide, but one saying don't fall into the traps. I don't think there is any question that solutions journalism, as we've heard it described, addresses a need. I would direct your attention, if you want to look at this, to something Tina mentioned very, very briefly in her introduction, which is the uh, BBC's solution-focused journalism. Note the small difference in the language there uh, on Facebook, which appears to be doing really, really well, so that what particularly young consumers of the BBC's online output do is the same as what they say they want. Um, and I think it's quite true that journalists get locked into patterns of negativity and it produces a crisis fatigue among uh, users. And I would say that a lot of solutions journalism is what we would certainly define in British journalism as features, not hard news. And that plays into a general trend in written journalism of what I would call magazinification. If you read the New York Times in print in Europe, I imagine proportion of this audience will read it in the American version, but if you read it in the European version, it is, a, it is a fascinating phenomenon. It is almost completely now a daily magazine. They have stripped out of the European printed edition almost every piece of hard news, virtually. The front page is just a selection of features that then run longer inside, and solutions journalism is particularly suitable, I think, to uh, features journalism. So if solutions journalism is truly the result of delivering public interest value and in particular listening to your potential audiences, then that's all great. I'm certainly not against solutions. It would be like being against blue sky and ice cream. <laughs> Journalists 
however, do good by, or their way of doing good is telling the truth. My working definition of journalism is that it is a systematic attempt to tell the truth about what matters to society in real time. I think it is important, I think words are really important, and I like the BBC formulation, which I drew attention to a moment ago, because it's solution-focused journalism. It's a slightly clumsier phrase than solutions journalism, but what it does is remove it from any suggestion of activism, which I think is a good piece of, good piece of wording. I'm also strongly in favor of show rather than tell. I have a certain amount of experience of uh, teaching journalists and student journalists, and my experience of the, if I can grossly average, about journalists and their spirit is that if you show them something that works, they get very enthusiastic about it and are encouraged to imitate it. If you tell them what to do, they leave the room. I'm sorry, speaking of leaving the room, I'm getting the sign that we must leave the room. Wow. So. Right, I'm going to be super quick. It's not a magic fix for everything. Some of journalism is a battle of ideas. If you're an opinion writer, one of your jobs may be to belittle the arguments of your opponents. That is as unconstructive as it gets. It's also a good service to sense-making in society. Uh, I'll stop there. Oh, no, I had a last thought, actually. In the next few years, journalists are going to have to do some solutions journalism on journalism itself. I leave you with that. <laughs> Yeah, 